Okay, let's all stand, please. So we're going to take a few minutes and worship, and then we're going to go into the Word together. Father, we thank you for uh, your presence. Lord, we ask you that you would touch our hearts, our minds, our bodies as we worship you. Magnify your Son in Jesus' name. Magnify your Son. Father, we magnify your Son. Stelia tiara comedia sena. Kaliaka. Stelia tiara comedia sena. Akalamena ka, kaliaka. Reliaka, stelia tiara. You are beautiful in holiness, God. You are majestic in your holiness, God. Son of God, we magnify you in the name you have been given. The eyes of fire and the voice like thunder. Voice like many waters, we lift our hands to you, we lift our hearts to you, we lift our eyes to you. You are perfect on your throne. Jesus, the lover of my soul, the one who's in control when all the world fails me. Jesus, the one I long to hear, the one who draws me near, the one who is in me. On you comes the sea, on you who loves to speak to me, on you I will wait patiently.
Jesus, the one who draws me near, whose voice I long to hear, the one who is in me. On you comes the seas, on you who loves to Oh 
for the silence to
wings of mama, the wings of mama. I'm under the wings of mama, the wings of mama, the wings of mama. Yeah, I find refuge here. I find refuge here Under the wings of my Abba The wings of my Abba The wings of my Father I'm under the wings of my Abba The wings of my Abba The wings of my Father Under the shadow of your wings, ah, wings, ah, your wings. I don't feel the arrow here. I don't fear the arrow. I don't fear the arrow here. I don't fear the fire here. I don't fear the arrow here. 
I don't feel the fire
for a wonderful, refreshing night in your presence. I pray that you would stay in the room very thick with us, God, and just help us to have clean hearts. Help us to maintain a life that's lived solidly in your presence, God. Solidly before you, with integrity before you. We reach up to you, Jesus, and thank you for reaching down to us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Your worship team. All right, we'll just take a few moments and uh, greet your neighbor. We'll just kind of mingle a little bit and then um, we'll jump in. Okay, let's all uh, find our seats, please. Um, if you need any, um, if you need any notes, uh, please raise your hands, and um, we'll get them to you. If you need any notes for session six, go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, the ushers will get them to you. All right, just keep your hand up, and so they. Uh, know how to get them to you. And turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. We're continuing on the uh, session in John 13, session, uh, John 17, sorry, wow. (laughs) 
John 13, John 17, John 14, session six. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for who you are. Father, thank you for your presence. Lord, we say that uh, your nearness is our good. Thank you, Lord, that we have access to your throne. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would open up our eyes to your law. Lord, let us see glorious things in your holy heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 14. So I want to take the next few moments and talk about entering into the holiest of all. Entering into the holiest of all. Now, this is a phrase um, that comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, the writer um, exhorts uh, the community that he's writing to to re-engage their hearts uh, with the Lord. And he talks about this entering into the holiest of all. Now, uh, this is not a course on the book of Hebrews. I just finished teaching on Hebrews, so it's fresh in my mind. But uh, uh, when he's talking about the holiest of all, in the context of the book of Hebrews, I believe he's referring to two things. Number one, he is referring to the new Jerusalem. Uh, one of the main themes of the book of Hebrews from beginning to end is about the subject of the new Jerusalem. And secondly, I believe he's referring to God himself, God himself as the holiest of all. If you remember in Revelation chapter 22, verse 22, when John sees the celestial city, he said he looked and he said that he saw no temple. He said, but that God and the Lamb, they were the temple. Now, there's a lot to be said about the temple, but for our purposes tonight, the temple is simply the place where God dwells. The temple is the place where God resides, where God dwells, and from where his government, so to speak, and is, goes forth throughout all of the created order. And so when in Revelation chapter 22, verse 22, it says that John did not see a temple because God himself is the temple and so is the lamb, that is a very, very, very profound statement because if a temple is that which in God dwells, John is saying that God dwells within God. And that's what we see in John 13 to 17. We see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, this, this mutual indwelling of one another. And so this John 14, when we're looking at the Father's house, and we'll look at it in just a few moments, there are several implications to what it means for uh, what Jesus means by the Father's house. In Isaiah 57, verse 15, the prophet Isaiah, he declares that God inhabits eternity. Isaiah 57, verse 15, he says that God inhabits eternity. I believe that when the Bible talks about God inhabiting eternity, I really believe that he's talking about God inhabiting God because God himself is eternity. Because for God to dwell in something other than himself means that there's something greater than himself. It's Isaiah 57, verse 15, God and he who inhabits eternity. I think, you start, I think right there is another one of those hints of God being a temple, of God dwelling in God. And of course, John 13 to 17, we begin to see the breakdown of that it's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It is this family dynamic of how they dwell in and with one another in love. Now, what is happening in John 14, this is the chapter before, John 13, Jesus, uh, John, he emphasizes the departure of the Son of God. And then Jesus himself, he makes the announcement in verse 33 to his disciples that he is departing. Now, undoubtedly, this announcement of Jesus declaring to his disciples that he was leaving, this undoubtedly was a blow to the team. I mean, this must have hit them really really, really, really hard. 
I remember uh, several years ago, I was working uh, with another ministry, and uh, I just I had gotten hired, and, and I remember I was there for, I don't know, a, a couple, of, uh, couple of months, and the person who hired me really just kind of helped me uh, fit in the team and was just a bit of a, a stabilizing force for my beginning days at the team, and I will never forget when he announced that he was leaving. And I, I remember him saying, well, I got an announcement to make. And the way he said it, I knew where this was going. And my heart was going, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> right? And I can only imagine how the apostles felt after having walked with the Son of God in the flesh for three and a half years. They witnessed his leadership. They witnessed his wisdom. They witnessed how he managed them as a team. I mean, think of all the times we've seen the gospel, how they argued with each other, and Jesus having to be in the midst of that and as a peacemaker to help them get along and work through their issues. Um, Think of how Jesus dealt with a hostile government, how he dealt with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and and the intensity of the debate and the conflict that existed between him and them. And so I can only imagine the apostles thinking, man, How's it going to work for the 12 of us to get along? I mean, we barely get along. And how is it going to work for us to uh, uh, operate um, in terms of the ministry that he's called us to operate in, in light of this hostile, in, uh, hostile environment? And so there's many, many questions, undoubtedly, that is hitting this, uh, this apostolic team. And so the announcement of Jesus' departure, I believe it was deafening. I don't think he could hear anything else uh, in terms of what it is that he had said uh, up until that point. The disciples, they don't even ask a question at all about what it is that he had just taught them. One of the things that we see often is Jesus teaches something, and then the apostles will ask a question in light of what he just taught. And Jesus in John 13, he just spent line upon line teaching them about the importance of humility, about the importance of forgiving love, and the commandment of how they are to love one another in the same way that God has loved them. And they're not even asking a question by that because in the midst of that instruction, Jesus just drops this bomb, so to speak, on them and says, guess what? He goes, I'm leaving. And I believe this is deafening to them. They can't hear anything else except for the impact of that announcement that he is, that uh, uh, that he's leaving. And so what happens is in John 14, there are four questions that uh, that, uh, that the disciples asked. The first one is asked by Peter in John 13, 38. Then Philip asked the questions. Then uh, Thomas asked the question. And then Judas, not as, uh, the one that called the scared, asked the question. But I believe that these questions that they're asking all come from this, uh, fr- uh, from this announcement that Jesus just gave them. They said, I am leaving. It, it, just, it, it stirred up a, a whole series of concerns And questions, and they bring these questions to the Lord, and then Jesus gives them, uh, he answers those questions. And and so the answers to those four questions together is what gives us John chapter 14. John 14 is Jesus addressing, I believe, the questions and the concerns that the apostles have. Now, in uh, verse 27, John 14, verse 27, he says this. He says, "Peace, he, He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world uh, gives, so do I. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Let, do not be fearful. And so these, these questions that they were asking, they, were, they, they came from a troubled heart. They came from a fearful heart. Incidentally, when Jesus in John 14, 27 says, let not your hearts be troubled, I believe he's talking to all, the, uh, all 12 disciples. But in John 14, verse 1, when he says, let not, let not your heart be troubled, he's talking to Peter. Because it's part of the answer that he gives to Peter's question that he asked in John 13, 37, and 38. And we'll look at that in just a few moments. In John 14, 28, what I believe happens there is Jesus summarizes. It summarizes Jesus giving assurances to his disciples that he laid out in the chapter all throughout, and I got, the, I got the isolated verses there, but up until that point, Jesus is giving assurances to his disciples, and John 14, verse 28, summarizes that assurance. And here's the bottom line of the assurance that Jesus gives them. He assures them, and he assures us, deep 
intimate partnership with the Trinity in this age and in the ages to come. He, he assures us that he will be with us. I don't have this in the notes, but I was thinking earlier today um, as I was getting ready about Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go into all the world to make disciples. And he says, he says, lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. He once again assures them, he goes, I am going to be with you and you are going to be with me. And that's what's happening then in verse 28. He assures them of that deep, intimate partnership, not only in the age to come, but in this age as well. Paragraph C, paragraph C, the, uh, uh, I believe that the concerns that the apostles have or the questions that the apostles have, I believe that they are the same core concerns every wholehearted believer has. Every wholehearted believer, I believe, has these core questions. Uh, not necessarily every believer. The reason I'm saying that is because if we're not given to being wholehearted, I'm not talking about being perfect or mature, but when we're giving to wholeheartedness, there are a different series of questions that get stirred up within our heart. And I believe that these four questions are the questions that are in the heart of every wholehearted believer. And it might be in a different version, but the, but the essence of it, the core of it, these are the questions that I think that are within our hearts. And Jesus answers those questions. He, he, he gives us instruction. He gives us insight. He gives us assurances. He, he calms our fears. He brings peace. He gives us confidence that, yes, that he will be with us in this age, and he will be with us in the ages to come, and that there is deep, profound satisfaction, partnership, an encounter that we can have with God in this age. Number one, there's a paragraph C, uh, number one, is the question of resolve. The question of resolve. Peter says to the Lord in verse 37, John 13, 37, he says, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And the Lord actually makes this point. He goes, and essentially saying, Peter, he goes, no. He goes, this is, this is not time for this right now. He goes, I'm the one that's going to lay down my life for you. He goes, he goes, I'm not just merely dying as a martyr. He goes, I'm actually dying as a sacrifice for your sin." The sins of the world, number one. Number two, I am dying that you would have access to my Father's presence. And thirdly, I'm dying that ultimately in the ages to come, the whole earth will be filled with the fullness of the glory of my Father. And so Jesus didn't merely die as a martyr. He died with and for a purpose. In fact, it says in uh, Mark 10, 42, that he came for that very reason. He came to give his life as a ransom. Uh, one of the things that shows up in the Gospel of John several times is the issue of the hour. The hour has not yet come. The hour is not yet. And in John 17, uh, 1, Father, the hour has come. In other words, the purpose for which I have come is now upon us the purpose of my death. Jesus came. He was, he was the king who was born to die. He didn't merely die as a martyr for a cause. His death actually meant something. It actually purchased something. It, it accomplished something far beyond our wildest imagination. Number one, it, it purchased uh, uh, the, uh, the atonement for our sins. It is because of his death on the cross that, and he says this uh, in, in Matthew 26, in the context of John 13, he said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Secondly, he died that we might enter into the holiest of all, that we would enter into relationship with the Godhead. And thirdly, he died really to prepare the earth to be filled with the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the seas. And so to the question of, Lord, 
I will die for you. Why can't I follow you now? The answer to that is that God is, that Jesus is the one preparing a place through his death. He goes, Peter, the thing that you're wanting to do will not accomplish the thing that I'm about. He goes, your resolve will not accomplish it, but my resolve will. Isaiah 9, verse 7. He goes, the zeal of the Lord of hosts is the one who will accomplish this. The second question that gets asked is the question of, is the question of proximity and access. Now, so the first question is the question of resolve. It is, it is the, and it's the question that goes like this. Do I have or do we have what it takes to walk in the way that God wants us to walk? And the answer to that is what? No, we don't have what it takes. And the sooner that we acknowledge that, it is, uh, it is the sooner that we will begin to experience rest and confidence in his ability in his zeal, and his power, and his empowerment to walk in the way that he wants us to walk. Uh, I love Deuteronomy 29, verse 4 and 5. It says that the Lord, uh, 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 Moses says the Lord has not, he tells him back then, he says the Lord has not yet given you a heart to see and perceive. You know, when we talk about the new covenant in Jeremiah 30, uh, uh, 31, 33, he says that the Lord will give you a new heart. He will take your heart of flesh and, uh, and a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and he will put his law uh, in your heart and your mind. He'll put his spirit in you. The very resolve of Christ is the thing that gets imparted to us that we must cooperate with. We must say yes to it and walk in his ways because now we've been given the, uh, the gift of God's grace. Secondly, the question is a question of Proximity and access to God. I believe that that is one of the, the deep-seated questions that every sincere, wholehearted believer asks. It's the, it's the question of, of proximity, wanting to be near to him, wanting to, uh, to, wanting to be as close to him as possible, and yet all the challenges of life that come our way uh, uh, seem to, so to speak, hinder uh, 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 the, uh, the truth of that experience. And yet, Jesus tells Thomas, he gives us the assurance that knowing Christ, knowing Jesus is the way to access with the Father. And knowing Christ, we have guaranteed access to the Father. We're not left to our own devices. We're not left to some voodoo formula, we're not left to some hocus pocus, we're not left to some kind of a clever spirituality. No, we simply put our faith and our confidence in the fact that we know Christ Jesus and his leadership will guide us and lead us into knowing the Father. And so we have confidence to having proximity and access to God. The third question is the question of satisfaction. Will this journey be fulfilling? Will this journey be satisfying? Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. He's asking the question of satisfaction, that knowing and seeing the Father, knowing God is the thing that would satisfy the human heart. What is interesting is, remember earlier, we talked about how Jesus said that he was leaving. I mean, I can't, I mean, I wasn't there, but I can only imagine, I mean, I can only imagine what it was like for these band of brothers, so to speak, to walk with Jesus and to hear the words that were coming from his physical mouth. It says in John, uh, Luke 4, it says that the people marveled because of the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. I mean, th there was power on his words. Th there was a way about 
that he set things, and it undoubtedly impacted their hearts and their minds. They loved listening to this man when he spoke. Later on in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, he, he talks about the issue of fasting. And, you know, the question was, hey, the disciples of John fast. He goes, why don't your disciples fast? And he says, that's because I, the bridegroom, I'm in their midst. He goes, their longing has not been awakened. He goes, but once I'm taken away, he goes, they will mourn. He goes, they will long for me. And so I imagine in the question of, Lord, show us a father and it'll be sufficient for us. It's almost like he's saying, okay, I know you're going to go. Just show us a father and I think we can hang in there until then. The question of satisfaction, the satisfied heart. And the answer to that is, is that Jesus says in John 14, 21, I will show myself to you. I will show myself to you, and in showing myself to you, you will encounter the Father. The fourth question is the question of encounter. The question of encounter. Will we truly experience him in deep ways, and if so, how? Will we experience him in the inner man, in deep ways, and if so, how? And the answer to that is John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit will instruct us. In John 14, 26, I believe Jesus gives one of the primary assignments of the Holy Spirit, which is to give us insight into what Jesus just taught there in John 14. I'm going to say this again. Verse 26, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And I don't think the all, I mean, the all things is all things, but I think in context, the all things is related to what it is that he's teaching them. He will instruct you on, uh, 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 he will instruct you in this manner. And not only will he instruct you, he will bring to remembrance the things that I have taught you insofar as the issue of dwelling with God. Now, what's interesting is that um, uh, passages like Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, for those of you who are taking notes, Colossians chapter 1 to 3, Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, 1 Peter chapter 1, Romans four to, uh, 3 to 8, and many other passages, but that's a, those are some real good clusters. They are all expounding on what it is that Jesus is teaching here in John uh, 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 14 and 15. Actually, all the way uh, uh, over to 17. Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, Colossians 1 to 3, 1 Peter 1, Romans 3 to 8. Those are a cluster of passages that uh, were the apostles are expounding and instructing based upon what Jesus was introducing here in John 14. Turn the page over to page two. John 14 uh, focuses on the access Jesus is putting in front of us, I believe, a vision of interaction and partnership that we can have with the Father. John 14, the, great, the greater emphasis of John 14 is the revelation of the Father. The greater emphasis of John 15 is the revelation of the Son. And the greater emphasis of John 16 is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The greater emphasis of John 14 is the revelation or the ministry of the Father. The greater emphasis of John 15 is the ministry of the Son and the revelation of the Son. And the greater emphasis of John 16 is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about our spiritual union with the Trinity. 
In the old covenant, it taught us that only the uh, high priest could draw near to the glory of God and that he could only do that once, once a year. So in the old covenant, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer sacrifice, and he was the only one who could do that, and he could only do it once a year. But then the prophets, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, come on the scene, and they're prophesying that there's coming a new order or a new covenant where the God of Sinai would no longer dwell in a box, but he would actually dwell in the human beings. I mean, this is staggering to think about the implications of what it is that Jeremiah and Ezekiel are, are prophesying. We're talking about the God of Sinai. We're talking about the God of, of Exodus 19, that when he came down to betroth himself to Israel, when he came down in his glory and in his power, he told the people that until he gave them permission, they were not allowed to touch the mountain lest they be struck dead. And it is that great glory and power of Sinai that Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesy and say, guess what? That glory of Sinai will actually come and dwell inside of the human spirit. It's, it, is, it is absolutely stunning what's being said over there. You know, in uh, Numbers 14, you know, Moses, you know, he's a, uh, teaching at uh, the EGS in the wilderness. And uh, he, he gets this prophecy. Now think about this. Moses is the one, if I'm not mistaken, he's the first one to give this prophecy. And he prophesies that the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now I imagine this young 13-year-old Jewish boy sitting in the back row raising his hand and says, he says, Pastor Moses, I got a question for you. He goes, yes. He goes, what's going on over here? Didn't you just teach us a couple of months ago that God's glory was going to dwell in a box and Uncle Aaron is the only one who could go in there once a year with blood from sheep and goats? He goes, yes, I did teach that. Don't you have, are you teaching us that if anyone else were to go in there, they would be struck dead? He goes, yes. He goes, then how can you say that the glory that lives in that box is now going to fill the earth? Because in saying that, Moses is making this statement that the earth will become the holy of holies. It is, it's mind-blowing what Jeremiah and Ezekiel are prophesying. It is staggering. I mean, Uzzah tried to steady the ark. He, he didn't even touch the ark. He, 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 uh, he touched the, uh, uh, the, the cart, and he dies. And yet, throughout the Old Covenant, God prophesies there's coming a time where the glory of the ark will live inside of the human spirit. It's absolutely amazing. This, but here's the challenge for us. This most glorious truth of God living in us is often neglected and probably one of the least emphasized and expounded upon truth in the body of Christ. This glory of the new covenant, of God living in us and us living in him, which is what is happening here in John 14. The most glorious, often neglected, and one of the least emphasized and expounded upon truths is the subject of our spiritual union with the Trinity through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, there was something radical that took place when we were born again. Our spirit was dead. We were members of another kingdom. It says in Colossians that we were conveyed from 
the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. It says that we were dead. And because of our faith in Christ and the finished work of the cross, the Holy Spirit entered our innermost beings and brought us to life from the inside. And so the Spirit lives in us. One of the most, uh, I'm not talking about experience right now, I'm talking about reality. The reality is, is that we will never have more of God in us right now. We will never have more in us a billion years from now than we have right now. I'm talking about reality right now. I'm talking about the experience. We will experience Tons more in the age to come in the resurrection in terms of his glory. But, but the fullness of God came and took residence inside of our spirit when we were born again. It's absolutely amazing. And this is part of what Jesus is uh, seeking to convince his disciples of in John 14. As born-again believers, we have become now the temple of God who dwells in us. And so God dwells in God. God dwells in his church. God dwells in us as individual believers. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. God dwells in the new Jerusalem. And before this whole thing is over, God will dwell in fullness in the earth. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, He has been joined with the Lord as one spirit with him. I love 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, yes, the deep things of God. Now we who have received the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That there are deep things of God's holy heart that are now available to us because we have received the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us And in verse 12, one of the things the Spirit longs to do is to instruct us, to teach us, to convince us of all the free things that are available to us in the grace of God. Paragraph C, in John 14, I believe that Jesus gives a foundational understanding of our spiritual union. Again, I think it's the Spirit's primary assignment, I believe, to instruct and guide us in our understanding and experiencing this spiritual union. The phrase that uh, we like to use here is the first commandment in first place. It is the Holy Spirit's Number one, I believe number one mission, number one assignment to to teach us, to instruct us of everything that's available to us in the grace of God and and to convince us of the fullness of the experience of his presence that we can have on the inside in this age, in this age. Yes, and indescribable heights in the age to come. But beloved, there there are indescribable heights of experience in the grace of God in the inner man that's available to us in this life. And the end time church will experience them, I believe. The the apostles, they expounded on this, as I mentioned earlier. Ephesians 1 to 3, Colossians 1 to 3, 1 Peter 1, Romans uh, 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 3 to 8. Other passages as well. Paragraph D, to to overlook or to neglect this truth of the spiritual union that is available to us and that we have as born-again believers, 
I believe that it will lead us into the opposite of the answers that Jesus gives to the four questions that are being asked by the disciples. The disciples are asking four questions. Jesus gives them four answers. But to not ask, not, but, but to not go on a journey with the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, would you teach me? Would you teach us about this spiritual union that we have to, with the Father? Would you teach us? Would you instruct us? What, you know, it's, it's, it's thank you, show me more. I mean, that's really what it is. Thank you, show me more about these truths. To overlook them, to minimize them, to not prioritize our lives around them is going to result in the opposite of what Jesus is addressing in John 14. First thing that will end up happening, we will end up walking in religious striving. Where we seek to, by our own strength, to, uh, to walk out the things of God. Secondly, we will end up having, and I'll explain this more in just a moment, but we will end up having primarily a spatial or a geographical relationship with God. A spatial or a geographical relationship with God. Um, what do I mean by that? Hmm, I'm trying to think of how to say this in a way that will help us. But there is this idea that some people have that it is an intimacy with God, intimacy with God until they are physically taken up into the realm of the Spirit. In other words, as long as I'm down here, there is this physical distance between me and God. Now, yes, there is a spatial dynamic with God for sure. I mean, you know, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and he went up. <laughs> And he, says, and he said, the same way that you see me going up is the same way that I'm coming down. And yes, the city's coming down, Jesus is coming down. I, I get all that. I'm not dismissing any of that. I want to emphasize the, uh, the great glory and privilege that is available to us through this thing called spiritual union. And if, if, and if our emphasis is purely geographical, where... Now I'm just going to move on. <laughs> Thirdly, spiritual boredom. And so the first one is that um, religious striving. Secondly, a geographical or a purely a spatial relationship with God. Ah, I'll, yeah, here we go. I found a better way to say this. <laughs> it's, it's when... If, if, our intimacy, if our intimacy with the Lord is limited to the prayer room, then you have a special relationship with God. I'll say this again. If your intimacy with the Lord is limited to the prayer room, I love the prayer room. The Lord has gathered us to a geographical location as a people uh, to dwell together with one another and with him for a purpose. Yes and amen. But if... Our intimacy with the Lord is limited to the prayer room that we have a spatial relationship with God. Or if your intimacy with the Lord is, now some of you are going, I know, what, I know exactly what's happening. Some of you are going, okay, I knew it. I need to have an intimacy with God at home. Well, if your intimacy with God is limited to your home, you have a spatial relationship with God. <laughs> Okay. The third one is spirit, <laughs> spiritual door, uh, boredom. And the third thing that happens is we actually end up coming up short to the fullness of the experience in God's grace that's available to our spirit in this age. In John, four, in John chapter 4, Jesus began to address this to the woman at the well. He says, woman, believe me. This takes faith. Believe me in this, he tells her. The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. 
He says, but the hour is coming and is now. And we are in a 2,000 year now, beloved, that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And in a lot of ways, Jesus is taking what he told the woman at the well in John 4, and he is expounding on the implications of it in John 14, as it pertains to our union with him. There are inward encounters that await us in this age. I want to say this again. There are inward encounters that await us in this age. We are destined for far more of what the Father will give us before the Lord returns or before we meet him in death. The thing that uh, is so amazing to me is Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. The apostle Paul makes a staggering statement. It, it is an intense statement if we actually think about what it is that he's saying. In Galatians 1.15, he says, for it pleased the Father, so that right there is an intention getter, that this thing brings great pleasure to the Father. He says, it pleased the Father who formed me in my mother's womb and called me to reveal his son in me. And so I imagine Paul, you know, going over for dinner somewhere or going to some restaurant or talking to some friends or meeting some new people. And he says, and they say, so Paul, you're called. He goes, yes, I am called. He goes, so are you called to be an apostle? And, and they go, well, yeah but it's a little bit more intense than that. Wait, are, you, are you called to preach the gospel and plant churches and lead people and administrate and all that kind of stuff? He goes, yeah, but it's actually way, way more intense than that. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, my calling is to live in such a way to posture my heart before the Father in such a way to have inward encounters with the living Christ. It's, it's, it is a staggering statement. Now, we know the life of Paul. He did all kinds of things. He wrote books, best-selling books. <laughs> Planted churches, did leadership training, all kinds of things. But Galatians 1.15, I believe, gives us the primary calling. It, it, it is Paul's one thing, so to speak. He goes, I, my calling my destiny is first and foremost to live my life in such a way. The reason why the Father formed and fashioned me in my mother's womb is for the purpose of living a life for, uh, of having inward encounters with the living Christ. Amen. Philippians 4.23, I love it. The grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul, he, he bestows this blessing. He, he bestows this desire. He communicates his longing for the church of Philippi. He goes, I would that you would have deep encounters in your spirit with the grace of Christ. John 7, verse 38. He who believes in me, Jesus says, as the scripture said, from his innermost being, will flow rivers of living waters. Talking about the Holy Spirit, talking about the presence of God, I believe that these rivers uh, are further expounded upon in passages like Psalm 36, verse 8, that uh, we will be abundantly satisfied. There is the question of sufficiency, that we will be sub abundantly satisfied by the rivers of his pleasures or the rivers of his desires. Uh, 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 Psalm 46, verse 5, it says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Beloved, there is pleasure and gladness to be found as we actually begin to tap into this spiritual union that Jesus is addressing here in John 14. In John 4, verse 14, when he's talking to 
uh, this, uh, uh, this woman, uh, it, I mean, just all the pain and the dejection and the temptation and her own sin and her own brokenness, Jesus stands before her and, he's, and he looks at her and he says, look, he goes, what you need to do is you would need to begin to drink. John 4, 14, I love it. Jesus says, he who drinks, it is a present tense statement, a present tense drinking of the water that he offers us, we will never thirst again. When Jesus says he who drinks, I don't think he is simply referring to coming to the altar call, praying the sinner's prayer. No, he's talking about the present tense drinking experiencing the inward encounters of the Holy Spirit, actually beginning to engage with the spiritual union that he has made available to us through the cross. Deep encounters with his divine pleasures. In page three, Jesus, he assures his disciples that he will be with them after he is gone, until his return, by introducing them to this reality of dwelling with God or dwelling in the Father's house. The writer of Hebrews tells us to have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, that we get our confidence and our resolve because of the finished work of the cross, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He says, by a new and a living way, in other words, that is Holy Spirit guided and Holy Spirit empowered. Whereas before the high priest would go in by the shedding of the, the blood of sheep and goats, he would go in once a year. He says, you and I have access to the holies of all. We have access to the holy of holies. We have access to the Father's house because of the resolve of the Son of God who died on the cross and because of the empowerment and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the new and living way. So Jesus assures his disciples that he will be with them after he is gone. And that's the dilemma because remember, when Jesus says, I will be gone, it's like they couldn't hear anything else. And they begin asking all of these questions about proximity and, and satisfaction and nearness and purpose. And he says, no, I will be with you. I'll be near you. He says, in my father's house. The adjective my is already an indicator that Jesus will be there since it is his father that he's talking about. He goes, because it is my father, I will be there. When you are there, Jesus lives there and we are with him. The mention of the Father points us to familial dynamics into which we are invited. We are invited into this relationship between the Father and the Son. Let's take a few more moments here. In John 14, I believe, it gives us one of the greatest expositions of the revelation of the Father and his desire to be with us. This is one of the greatest expositions of the Father and his desire to relate with us. Now this is significant because it is built upon the understanding of Yahweh. It is built upon the understanding of the God of Israel, the God of Sinai. Jesus comes on the scene and he looks at his disciples and as it were, and he says, you remember the God of Sinai? They go, yeah, you remember how terrifying that is? They go, yeah. You remember how glorious that was when you heard the story? They go, yeah. Because you remember Isaiah 6 when the angels, they are around the throne crying, holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah was completely overcome by what he saw to the point that he came on a deep conviction of his own sin. They go, yeah. He said, you remember how terrifying, how glorious, how majestic the God of Israel is? They go, yeah. He said, I want to tell you one more thing about him. They go, what? He said, he's your father. And this just, this was revolutionary. The implications of this are vast. The God of Israel is the God who in Christ we can experience as a God who is responsive to us. He's intimate with us. 
and he is inclusive. He's inclusive in the way that he relates to those who are in Christ. I need to kind of slip that in there because inclusivity is a whole lot of weirdness thing out there right now. So, <laughs> no, but, really, but the God of Israel, think about this. He's a father. He's a God who's responsive. Responsive how? We draw near to him. He draws near to us. When we step towards him, he actually draws near to us. He's responsive to our faith by working through us in the exact same way that he works through his son. He's responsive to us by giving us the Holy Spirit when we ask for it. He's even responsive to our obedience. Our obedience matters to him. It touches him in a deep, personal way, and he responds to us when we obey. He responds so powerfully, Jesus starts speaking French. No, just kidding. He had, uh, you know, he says, and, uh, you know, the one who obeys will be loved by me, and we, you know, they go, who's we, we? And uh, they go, where, where did we come in all of a sudden? What's going on over here? Why are you speaking French? No. <laughs> no, he says, when you obey, he goes, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, they come and they will make their home with us. So one of the things you find out there is that the Father's house, uh, we're looking at just a few moments, the Father's house has many components to them, and one of them is that we are the Father's house. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 3, he talks about uh, Jesus build, being the builder of the house whose house we are. We are the house of God. So the Father is responsive. Not only is he responsive, he's intimate. He, he gives us access to deep experiential union with him. Thirdly, he's inclusive. By allowing us to engage and participate in the family dynamic. Let's have the worship team come up. There is a multi-layered interpretation and application of the Father's house. Number one, the dwelling in the Father through spiritual union, that the Father himself is the house in which we dwell. Jesus says, I am the way to the Father. I'm the way not just to a place, I'm a way to a person. I'm the way to a person. The Father is the house. Number two, we are the house by the indwelling spirit. John 14, 23, we will come to him and make our home with him. Thirdly, experiencing the new Jerusalem in our spirit by being seated in heavenly places. And so, beloved, there are, there are three implications of the Father's house that are massive in their implications that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to teach us about to experience these things in our spirit. Number one, that we are in union with the Father, by living in him, number two, by union with the Father, by living him living in us, and thirdly, by our spirit being connected to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Thirdly, we enter into the Father's house through physical death. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And lastly, being with Jesus forever in the new Jerusalem, in the resurrection. But my uh, prayer for us tonight is that we would ask the Lord to help us grow in the understanding of these three, the first three, dwelling in the Father, the Spirit dwelling in us, and us see, being seated in heavenly places. There is, the Holy Spirit wants to teach us about these things, John 14, 26. He wants to teach us these things and he wants to bring to remembrance what Jesus told us about this. Amen. All right, let's stand and let's worship the Lord together. Show us yourself and we'll see you, Father. Show us.
us yourself and we'll see the Father. Jesus, show us yourself and we'll see the Father. Show us yourself and we'll see the Father. Jesus, show us yourself and we'll see the Father. Father, here we are. We stand before you. Show us yourself and we'll see the Father. Show us yourself and we'll see the Father. Jesus, here we are. Show us yourself and we'll see the Father.
is in us like rivers of living water. Manifest yourself in us. Christ in us. Show us yourself and we'll see the Father. To see you is to see the Father. To see you, to see you is to see the Father. Jesus. To see you is to see the Father. Lord in us. Please just fire. of your presence in us, Lord. Your divine pleasures in our hearts. Show us more. Show us more, Father. Inside these jars 
I'm 